those of us in the United States who love this country have an idea of the direction we'd like to see it go. There is a cultural divide. You can't avoid it on television or in the movies or anywhere, really. And what's even more devastating is the fact that 70% of America identify as Christian. This is Jesus Christ, the God who came to teach us to love one another. And yet we are so divided in the direction the country should go. I don't know where you stand on this, but I wanted to speak to one pastor who is making a huge impact. His tweets and the things he is writing seems to be resonating with a call to not take the name of Jesus in vain in the way that we use his name to get votes for one particular party or another. This is not necessarily a podcast about asking you which side to join, but just to consider who this person is and what he is saying. His name is Benjamin Kramer. He is a pastor of the Cathedral of the Rockies in Boise, Idaho. One of the tweets that he has said is, Dear Christian, our Savior displayed ultimate power in the world, but not with a sword, not with a gavel, not with a flag, but with a cross. Christ's power does not look like coercion or control over others. It looks like self-sacrificial love. And before we speak to Benjamin to get to his heart, I always go back to the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers with their swords and shields are coming to take Jesus because he was betrayed by Judas. And as they approach the garden and Jesus moves forward, his chief apostle, Peter, draws up his sword to defend and protect his master, his savior, his best friend, and in doing so, cuts the ear off of one of the guards who's come to get Christ. What does Christ do? He asks Peter, please put away the sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. And then he took the person who was sent to take him to jail. He reached down and he restored his ear. He healed him. The ear that had been cut off by the one who should have been practicing what Jesus had tried to teach him. So with that, here is Benjamin Kramer. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Welcome to All Heart with Paul Cardall. Like you, his guests are all heart. Just a reminder to subscribe to All Heart with me, Paul Cardall. Benjamin has a Master of Arts in Theological Studies, Church History, and Christian Thought from Nazarene Theological Seminary. Also, another Master's of Arts, Spiritual Formation from Northwest Nazareth University, and a Bachelor of Arts. Christian Ministries, Youth Studies, Northwest Nazarene University. So he's currently the campus pastor at the Cathedral of the Rockies in Boise, Idaho, which is near Nampa. You know, you're an academic of Northwestern, it's Northwest Nazarene. Yeah. 32% of the people that go there are from the Nazarene tradition, but the larger demographic of students, 68% come from different denominations. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's accurate. Did you know any Catholics or Latter-day Saints when you went to the university? Yeah, well, so growing up in Idaho, I had a lot of uh, Latter-day Saint friends. Um, the Catholic Church is not big in Nampa, but it is in, in Boise. Um, and so there were a few who actually attended uh, Northwest Nazarene as well. And 
especially going through, there's a, like a mandatory, I wouldn't say mandatory, I would say a required course in Bible and, uh, and Christian theology that everyone has to take. And so being a part of that class with multiple faith uh, backgrounds just added to the breadth of education there. Like when you hear the Catholic perspective, the Latter-day Saint perspective, the agnostic or atheist perspective in learning Christian theology, it really adds some really good depth and layers to that conversation. C.S. Lewis talks about a building, you know, and yeah. as you go into the hallway, there's all these doors with windows and you can look through those windows and see who they are. You go, there's a Methodist room, mm -hmm. Presbyterian room. He didn't mention the Latter-day Saints, but I imagine there's a Latter-day Saint room and you all have these different perspectives to see what's going on inside. And I've always thought what's interesting is C.S. Lewis never said, I wonder what it's like just to be in that room and not know what it's like to think and feel and experience traditions and a way of yeah. thinking that everybody else experiences in the other rooms, even though everybody's in the same building. Yeah, absolutely. That is so well said. I, you just made me think of Peter and Paul. You know, they have that conflict in, in Acts where Peter's like, no, we have to stay in this room, essentially, using that metaphor. And Paul's like, no, there's other people in this other room, the Gentiles, who, who also need to hear this too. And so I think that's been a part of uh, the people of faith ever since you know there was faith to have, is that we sometimes like to stay in our rooms rather than explore the rest of the house. Well, it's scary. It's, it is. And it's a culture shock when people come out of their um, yeah. faith tradition and and you know we'll get into that but one thing I want to clarify right now is when you speak to different people who live a Christian life and claim to be Christian you know if we talk about the Latter-day Saints they'll say in reference to what the church is they will always reference because I was a practicing Latter-day Saint for 45 years I loved that faith I would say the church which is mm -hmm our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and everybody else was not in the church. In, ca in Catholicism today, when a priest talks about the church, they will reference it's the Catholic church because nobody yeah. else is inside that. So you're in uh, Protestantism, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how would you define the church? Because I hear pastors say, we the church, and is that excluding other people? Mm. Uh, that's such an important question. I, I've, I think that's a question I've struggled with personally ever since I was little, because uh, I tried to count the other day, and I, I think I've gone through at least four different Christian traditions in my upbringing from the time I was little to where I am now. Um, I was in a, in a fundamentalist sect and then moved to evangelical circles and moved to uh, the church of the Nazarene, where I received my education, which is Wesleyan background. And now I'm in the United Methodist church as a, as a pastor. Um, and so I've been, you know, kind of wrestling with that question about what church is since I was um, little and in studying the early church and, and in my biblical studies, I've, I've really felt uh, more comfortable with the, the Greek word ekklesia, which you see its Hebrew uh, sibling in the Old Testament, uh, calling the, the community of, of God's people together, right? It's the people that's been called out to be a light to the world, to um, show the love of God, to reflect the image of God in the world. And that's in the season of Pentecost uh, in Acts 2, you see the Holy Spirit poured out. And that's the, the birthday of this ecclesia, the church. And so really, instead of looking for um, a, a definition of it's these people, like it's just Methodists, right? And maybe that's, you can talk about it on your in your sermons on Sunday, like this church, we're talking about this specific part of the ecclesia but i've i've come more comfortable of where where are we seeing the holy spirit because wherever the holy spirit is there is the people of god and the holy spirit it, all throughout the bible loves to break those barriers that we put around it right like god can only be right here in this room that i 
that I understand. And then the Holy Spirit's breaking those, those boundaries. And so I've been trying to look more of like, okay, how do we define church based on where the Holy Spirit is at work and look for that Holy Spirit in, in these diverse groups. And so we can come together under the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And for those that are unfamiliar with what that Holy Spirit is, mm. would, would you say, you know, we, we quote Galatians, you know, there are the fruits of the spirit yes, yes. and love and kindness. And I've seen this Holy Spirit move in people who have never even heard of Jesus Christ Yes, and moved in people. I'll give you an example. Uh, my wife and I, we travel a lot. We've been all over the world and that's really the heart that that my heart has helped expand my mind by observing other people in their faiths we went to a a hindi temple mm. and coming from uh my christian background i was like this is so wrong and so i was clouded in my judgment of going in and automatically believing that these people were never going to get it. Right. I was such a fool because there was a young couple. They were holding a little newborn baby. They were dressed in their Hindi temple clothing and they were beautiful. They were so ready to do whatever the tradition was. Here was the priest. Now he's got his shirt off. He's got the gown below his waist and he's lighting incense and putting fruit baskets. And, and, you know, I could read into that with all my biblical mind and go, oh, that's, that's, you know, the fruit, that's what Cain had and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I message with you, but I'm like, Lord, help me to stay focused and see. And you know what they were there to present this child that they gave birth to to this priest to receive a blessing they wanted mm. god to be part of that child's life and 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 by having god bless that child um they there in their commitment not only to that child but to each other to cleave unto each other mm. you know in 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 the marriage unit yeah i right there and then the mother was crying the Holy yeah. Spirit bore witness to me that Jesus was there in that moment mm. to 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 be with that family. And I I'm like, I'm not even gonna touch this. Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. So, I, I think yeah. I think you're speaking to where I resonate with as well. Cause it it oftentimes the the critique I will receive is that I'm not holding to historical Christianity when I feel opposite. I feel like if we deeply believe that God transcends all things and is in and through all things, then our, our gaze should be more of one of curiosity rather than saying, I already have it all figured out. I I'm, I'm certain of all truth. No, the disciple really is supposed to look for the continued mysteries of God. Um, and two things I want to say about the Holy Spirit. One, it is what God breathes into us in Genesis. It's the Ruach, the Spirit of God. And so if we believe that the God Spirit has been given to all of creation, especially humanity, then we need to look and see how that Spirit is at work in humanity, whether they you know, say with their mouth that they're a part of one sect or another. And then in, in Pentecost in Acts 2, you see God say, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Again, it's, it's not discriminatory. It's on all of creation, all that God has made. And, and so there's this really beautiful reality of, of that curiosity that you just talked about. It's like, where am I looking for the Holy Spirit being poured out on, on all flesh so that I can work in fellowship with that? We may not agree cognitively on certain aspects of things, but are we connecting with that deep uh, heart of, of what the Holy Spirit is calling us to, to do and be? And you have been learning quite some time because you you knew when you were five i think maybe seven years old that you wanted to do this you felt called yeah. as a child this is a gift you were given early and it's really defined your life's purpose um can you talk a little bit more about your journey the spirit led you as a child to where you are now but you saw a lot of division yeah uh, a, a lot of the opposite of the fruits of the spirit, I would say. Um, I was 
as I said before, the um, my parents joined this homeschool co-op here in, in Nampa, Idaho, that was actually part of a very uh, racialized view of Christianity called Christian identity. Um, and that's that's connected to another group that like British Israelism before the country was even founded. But it, it believes just incredibly hateful things. My parents realized like, oh my word, these are white supremacists that we're, <laughs> that we're building community with. And so they, they left and joined a non-denominational church. But to my young mind, this sort of fundamentalism that I was experiencing in both communities were, was virtually indistinguishable, really. And so I, I think I saw a lot of that division. Like I heard these beautiful words being preached on Sunday, read from scripture, but then so much fear and, and hatred towards outsiders, people who didn't believe the same thing that we did, uh, Mormons, especially Latter-day Saints, they, they villainize and demonize it. I mean, I, I had Latter-day Saint friends, you know, so it's like, uh, yeah. it, it didn't seem to mash up with what I was hearing from the Bible. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I got to the point when I was a senior in high school that like, I was trying to be a faithful Christian, but at the same time, I didn't want to try to exert power and control over people in the name of Jesus. I really wanted to see those fruits of the Holy spirit be part of my relationship with God and and other people. And, and I was deeply, and I, I don't think I can, you know, overstate this enough. I was deeply spiritually traumatized and manipulated um, in the movement that I was, I was raised in. And I think, experiencing that firsthand and personally, and I'm still going through a lot of like healing from that Mm -hmm. going through that firsthand, especially as a pastor in, in the area that I pastor to, it makes me so not want to do that to someone else. Um, And so I I think it's made me very, Paul says, uh, approach your salvation with fear and trembling. (laughs) And I, I think I have a lot of, fear and trembling in regards to how powerful spirituality and religion can be in, in detrimental ways that I really want that, that the Holy spirit to lead those relationships with people um, and, and not breed that division and control and fear that I experienced so much of growing up. Can you give us kind of a brief lesson on, on how Christianity became the leading faith of America and why we are so divided today? So maybe just one caveat is my, my expertise. uh, I hesitate calling myself an expert in any way. I'm, I'm a continued student student, right? Um, So anything that I have, I'm going to say is really in light of my continued learning and desire to understand more. And so hear my words as this is where I'm at right now. And I'm hoping to continue understanding the bigger picture. What what I've found in my uh, academic education was focused mostly on the 19th century and the early patristic fathers and mothers of the church. And then uh, American Christianity was was a deep has always been a deep passion of mine. Um, and, and I would say that I think starting with the Puritans is a really good example that you did have a lot of people fleeing here to for freedom of worship. Uh, but how that worship was expressed by particular groups is is different. Sometimes we think that, you know, we all wanted just to worship individually ourselves, but groups like the Puritans wanted to enforce their perspective of Christianity and impose it on on everyone through the law. I mean, we see that culminate with the Salem witch trials, which is a, you know, a Puritan driven trial. And they even get their name Puritan from their desire to purify, right? Um, And a common misconception is like, the Church of England is a Protestant uh, church. And so Britain was controlled by Protestantism at the time. And Puritans didn't think that they were Protestant enough right? They didn't think that they were going far enough to purify the world of Catholicism or anything that wasn't Puritan. And so in the midst of this, I think one of the myths that 
I grew up learning about the United States is that these were all very pious Protestant Christians that signed the Declaration of Independence um, and declared their independence from this. I grew up thinking it was a Catholic nation, right? This Britain that, that was controlled by the Catholic Church. But, but in reality, uh, the founding fathers there was three Catholics, there were several Congregationalists, there was Anglicans, uh, a ma vast majority of different Protestant sects that were represented there by the Founding Fathers, several agnostics like Benjamin Franklin, who don't get enough, you know, cred for being among a lot of these religious uh, folks. But they these founding fathers were more influenced by 19th century enlightenment, like philosophers like John Locke, um, Immanuel Kant, yeah. Hume, Descartes, and especially um, Thomas Jefferson, who wanted a society built on reason rather than divine revelation, right? Um, and, and so this, this democracy that they were trying to birth into the world is relatively new historically. Like we can see kind of roots of it in, in ancient Greece and stuff like that. But what they were trying to do in America was so distinct because they didn't want it controlled by religious um, revelation. They wanted it to be controlled and dictated by human reason, which allows for freedom of religion. Because if you, you can only have a a society that gives religious freedom when the government is not controlled by a particular religion, right? Um, and so I, that's really the perspective of, of the society that they were wanting to build. Now, as many scholars have pointed out, they too had their places of bigotry. They, they too had their, their places of uh, not seeing people as full persons and, and those sorts of things, right? There's a lot of work to do to bring the hope of their ideals into fruition. Um, but one of the most damaging myths that have, have persisted is we can trace it all the way back to Puritanism, that this country was meant to preference Christianity, specifically Protestant Christianity. And I would even take that further now. The tradition I was raised in, evangelicalism, would say we need evangelical Christianity, its interpretation of scripture enshrined into the laws of the of the country so that we can have a Christian, quote unquote, Christian nation, when when really the founding fathers were pursuing towards a nation founded on um, on reason. It, it is a pluralistic society that you are free to be a Christian in, not a Christian nation where everyone is required to abide by Christian principles and, and morality. Right. I think that's very clear is that there was this it started with an idea brought people here but they wanted to force that on everybody else and it seems to be that's what we love to do is to force our ideas and opinions on other people this is why facebook is making a lot of money <laughs> yeah. yeah you know i often think it's almost as though america is just going through this extreme amount of growing pains mm -hmm. We're all down here in a sand pile trying to learn how to get along with each other and that's the great american experiment okay well let's let's then move from the founding fathers what then happens because i know that we have the second great awakening and out of that you have so many churches being planted you have out of that the restoration movement the restorationists are like alexander campbell who created the church of christ um, the Joseph Smith, who founded the Latter Day Saint movement, mm -hmm. um, out of the Latter Day Saint movement, and that other, you get the Jehovah's Witness, you get all these restoration movements. Meanwhile, Catholicism is starting to grow as people are immigrating to New York City, Italians, Irish, um, and um, and then we're starting to see people of other faiths. But the Protestants, meanwhile, seem to have control over the politics of this country let's take the civil war for example mm. everyone was christian but they're killing their brothers and sisters in different states mm. i mean i why aren't these pastors getting together in the name of God and, yeah. and, and saying, you know what, instead of planning another church and raising more money, let's find out how we can merge all our resources together and, and become one. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is an essential question to continue at, to ask as we look towards <laughs> American history, because so there's it's so messy. And like you said, Protestants were at the forefront of laws and community all across the nation. But you see Protestant churches not only like rising up in warfare over each other, but owning human beings and using the Bible to justify owning human beings as property, right? And and tr- trying to get past that ideological, you know, chasm proved to be so combustible. You know, you, you look at the the time frames of the first and second great awakening, there's so much cultural anxiety of, of change. And I think that's one of the, the fundamentals of when when a when a society goes through growing pains, it's that change is already here. And we're trying to either grow to meet the moment or resist it, right? And so you can almost pin the Great Awakenings on the Revolutionary War. One happens right before that. And then the second one happens right before the Civil War. And so you have all of this huge, massive anxiety of where are we going as a nation? There's all of these, you know, quote unquote, new religious movements, you know, not only uh, Latter-day Saints and the Church of Christ, but you have the whole spiritualist movement um, that's moving around with very mystical ties to uh, ghosts and spirits and things like that that was just sweeping the nation. Um, So you'd have seance readings in churches and, and stuff like that. And so there's all of this kind of uh, anxious, uh, feeling in the spiritual community of like, where do we find truth? You know, where do we find this place where we can be certain of, and that can be really combustible when some say we need to move this direction and others say, no, we need to restore and reclaim what, where we've come from. And then there's Christians in the middle saying, can't we do both? Like, can't we hold on to those incredible things of the past, but yet say, you know, that God is doing something new here, right? Like, isn't God ever ancient, but ever new? Isaiah will say, behold, I'm doing a new thing. You know, that's not a lot of Protestants favorite scripture verses. Like, where's the t-shirts for that? Like, where's, you know, that God is always up to doing something new. And so are we ready for that, that, uh, um, I don't have a professor of history who would always tell me that the Holy Spirit is always correcting and fulfilling, yeah. always correcting and fulfilling. And so how is the Holy Spirit trying to correct us now? And I, I believe the Holy Spirit was trying to correct slavery, say this is wrong, like we need to do this. But are we going to receive that correction, you know, as as God's people, or are we going to fight against it? Um, and, and I think it really comes down this division that you're talking about, like, there's, as Ecclesiastes will say, there's nothing new under the sun. The, the, the most dominant elements of these divisions is power, money, uh, and, a, and a desire for control. And I think Protestants, you know, to, to throw my camp, you know, to take responsibility for that, we have seen such a pull for that power, that wealth, because once you become in charge, it's really hard to say we are doing this thing wrong and we need that correction of the Holy spirit to be able to, to open our hands and release the reins and say, let's do this together rather than us just being in charge of everything. When you start to grow, like you said, when you start to grow and you get power, it's very, very difficult to change Mm -hmm. a, a system that's working quite well. Yeah. Yeah. But these movements start to take place Mm -hmm. and we start to see people recognize they have a relationship with the Lord, not with religion. Yeah. A community is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're in this weird catch 22. So what are you doing? Gosh, you you said so much, so much, so many good. I things. know there's so I, much. there's a lot I, on my mind and heart. Yeah, I, I love this I, conversation. I, 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 I don't know why. I just let everybody know what that is. But uh, I think where I'd I'd start with that is you, you feel this. I think it's what it's palpable in every conversation is where are we finding authority, and there's a deep distrust towards authority right now. Um, I would say like, if you grew up in, you know, 
the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or you were a Protestant, or even, you know, some of my Catholic friends even, they're just saying, uh, and Americans in general, I mean, gosh, every election, there seems to be this distrust in big government, or the leaders that are there that are driving those things. <clears throat> and so there's, there's this desire to trust again, like we really want to trust, <laughs> we, we really want that, but there's been so much hurt from institutions um, that the, especially those that, that are claiming to be of God that have hurt people deeply that we don't know where to rest our authority anymore. So we're going to protect ourselves. We're going to withdraw um, and even deprive ourselves from that connection, that community in order to not hurt anymore. And I think there's so much validity to that. Like, don't subject yourself to hurt and shame and, and seeing your friends and family hurt. Like, don't do that. There, the, next, the next iteration of community is coming, right? Like it always goes in cycles, but, but you need to step away. If that's where you're at, you need to step away and, and not subject yourself to that. But, but I, I always come back and say, like, I, I think there's a deep longing for community and for trusting one another. Like, if we're going to accept each other and try to build this society together with mutual love and caring for our neighbor, then, then we need to learn these very tangible ways of, of trusting each other. Yeah. And I think we're seeing in institutions that have held power, um, one of the most sinister things I think with people who are in power, and we've seen this with Protestants a lot, and especially evangelicals, is that they will create threats in order to stoke fear in the people that support them so that they won't start questioning these things that it might be flaws in the institutions that they've long trusted, right? And I grew up like my mom jokes about it now. It's like, man, the church we went to, they, they would say that there's a demon under every rock. There's the demon of uh, more, you know, the, the, de the demon of being fat or the demon of being sick. And like, you have to cast those demons out. Like, you know, there's a demon everywhere. But now I feel like instead of looking for a threat around every corner, I start to question myself is like, why does that make me feel threatened? Because there's nothing more dangerous than a whole group of people feeling threatened by another group of people, right? right. And, and so instead of building our religious faith or our perspective of the world built on threats and like that phrase that I hear all the time, culture war, like we are at war against these threats. Like instead of having our perspective shaped that way, why don't we ask ourselves like, is that really something I need to be threatened by? Yeah. Am, am, am I, am I, is my faith really that fragile that that people group is a threat to me? Um, and, and then I think we can start saying, look, if, if I'm not threatened by you and you're not threatened by me, where can we find that common ground to start trusting each other again? Um, because people in power will always monopolize on our desire to feel in control to, to not be fearful, and they will stoke that fear to make us feel like other people are a threat, these enemies, whether it's on either side of the aisle, they will say, those people are a threat to you, you need to vote me into power to fix that threat, right, when it's not that, it's not either or, like, if we start to find this common ground and say, that people group who want to live that way, and have their own religious perspectives or no religious perspectives, why is that a threat to me and my family? Yeah. Why do, why do I need to impose laws to make sure that they live my way of morality, my definition of truth, so that I can feel safe? Uh, to paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite quotes from him is like, if, if a religion needs civil power to uphold it and protect it, it must not be a very good religion. And, and, and I, re, I really do believe that in deep ways. If we truly believe in the gospel and the healing salvation of Jesus Christ, yeah. why do we need a nation to uphold and ensure that truth among all people? Shouldn't, shouldn't the message itself, shouldn't the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ be powerful enough on its own to transform um, good, moral, kind, joyful people, you know, in, in, in the world, rather than imposing that by law and threat of criminal criminality on, on other people. And so I think, 
and now analyzing why we feel threatened and the people that make us feel threatened and to see if that's really from God or if it's from those in power that want to keep their power in the institutions that we're, tr- we're, we're going through this process of distrusting right now. And you have my mind going right to where Jesus is in, is bound up, torn up, crown mm. of horns on his head in front of Pilate. And Pilate says, yes, I can deliver you. you know? <laughs> and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Yes. And the apostles would be killed. They would be in prisons after prison after prison. And most of them, Paul, I glory in my suffering because they understood who they were and what the kingdom was. Yeah, so it's it's interesting, the dynamics, but having traveled in so many countries, you know, uh, for the last, oh gosh, I would say 12 years, I've been to so many countries. I believe the church, the heart of the, the Christian will survive with or without mm-hmm. America. Yeah. Because... Yeah. In Slovenia, they don't have an Easter bunny. They go to church and have their baskets blessed. And the basket is a representation of sacrifice and hard work and humility. And I'm like, no Easter bunny? They're like, well, what is that? (laughs) Don't tell them. (laughs) They don't have a Christmas tree. They put out a nativity. Wow. The gifts are put around the nativity that we give one another. And I thought, man, we have a lot of repentance we need to do in Mm. this country. Tell us why, I think in conclusion, why you feel, you know, we have individuals who believe in Christ. They've been disaffected, disaffected by the organized body of the church. They're hurting, but you want to roll up your sleeves and you want to get involved and you want to. Yeah. So what do you, what's your advice for those? Do we just keep praying and, or should, <laughs> should, you know, like Rick Warren says, just find a church and plug yourself in mm. and you'll find purpose in service. Um, which I <laughs> that sure sounds, do. that sounds like it would work really well for the pastor. <laughs> well, it's for a pastor to say. Yeah. Yeah. Know, Yeah, I I think that is such an essential question right now. I I, I think first for some context, uh, you know, as someone who loves church history, uh, like, let me encourage, you know, everyone who's maybe in the midst of that struggle, like, you don't feel like you belong, but you long for that community, or maybe you're just done with the institution at large. Um, the church goes through a reformation like clockwork every 500 years. And we're about 511, 512 years from Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation um, to, to reform the church. And we're, so we're smack dab in the middle of one right now. And the, and the Protestant Reformation had massive implications, like world changing implications to science, healthcare, all of all of the things in the world. Um, and we're in the middle of one right now. And so we as individuals are caught up in the midst of all of that change. Like we're not just seeing church reformation, we're seeing societal reformation, we're seeing global reformation, and we're not sure where it's all heading, right? And so we're in in deep anxiety. I don't know about everyone else, but I oftentimes have deep anxiety about where we're heading. You know, is it going to be a good outcome for people? Is it going to be a bad one for the most vulnerable um, in in our society? And so I I would start to say to fight fight off shame any way you can, because if you're shaming yourself for the predicament that you're in, then, you know, we're not looking at the bigger picture of this machine that we're caught in the middle of right now. So like give yourself a huge amount of grace that that you're still trying to hold on to the bedrock of what you thought was true and move forward and find authentic community that cares about those things too. And so that's the first thing I would say. Um, Secondly, we need to see repentance from institutions and the Protestant church. I'll just throw my tradition under the bus. We Protestants are not good at lamenting 
uh, you know, the sins that we've participated in, we're not good at confessing those sins and saying, this is how we've misused power. And we're not good at repenting like intangible infrastructure ways uh, to, to, to heal the damage that those things have done. And, and those are pretty central Christian things, lamenting, confessing, and <laughs> repenting, right? Okay. If, if, if we're not doing that as institutions, then individuals will never have a place among us. They, they will either have this either or choice of you come along, you conform to where, what we're doing or get out, you know, get on the bus or get off. When the church is supposed to be this group of people that is most willing to lament the problems in the world, most willing to reflect and say, how have I contributed to these problems? And then most willing to repent from those things. And, and if, if we can get a community of people that is willing to do that in humility, then we will start to see authentic trust and love being built. And, and that's my desire as a, as a pastor, even though I'm part of a denomination, the United Methodist Church, I, I feel most at home to where I can try to build that community in this place that I'm ministering now, where you'll hear a pastor say, this is where we got it wrong and try to be as transparent as possible. And so those of you who are looking for community, look for a place where the leader is willing to repent, where the leader is saying, these are the problems of our own tradition. And if they're not willing to be transparent about those things, then that's not a community that cares about you trusting them, right? Um, and, and so those, I think those are the three main pieces of advice that I would, I'd really see as important in this cultural moment that we're in. I think those three are fascinating insights into what is happening. I would, I would think in terms of, you know, that, that, that great reformation, that are the great change that's taking place. This is something I would think atheists and agnostics want to pay attention to mm. because it affects the, the, their posterity, the people they leave behind. Where's the church headed? Because they have had so much control in the past and clearly they're fighting to get the church out of power. Mm. The church is taxed. Some churches probably should be taxed. Mm -hmm. If anything, they should at least disclose on their website, their financials, the way that uh, every charity in the United States yeah. uh, has their financials exposed. And the politicians that they're supporting. Small, small churches, of especially those people of color, are not doing those things that a lot of majority white mega churches are doing mm -hmm. in supporting of candidates through nonprofit sources. So like those are the churches that should be very transparent about their finances um, and, and potentially be taxed for, for what they were doing. Yeah, the prosperity gospels and, you know, written, the reek of legalism and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. of, you know, you need to do this in order to get this. There's so many. But yeah, it's an ongoing thing. But people tend to rise above institutions. Mm. And we've seen this time and time again through the history of the world. We are God's children. God is mm -hmm. in control. And, you know, I often, and that's what gives me peace. I wake up every day. And I say to myself, you know what? I don't want it to end. Yeah. I like the complex, crazy world we live in. Yeah. And I love that we're all trying to figure it out. Yeah. We're trying to learn how to get along with each other. You know, we see changes. We, we see people in their sexuality struggling. We see people of color struggling. We see so many people trying mm -hmm. to finally have a voice yeah in, in all of this so i appreciate everything that you've 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 talked about and you've said and um is there a way for people to reach out to you if they have more questions and are your sermons available online anywhere yeah, you can actually, we just launched a sermon podcast, uh, Cathedral of the Rockies Amity Campus, I, and I'll give you these links to put in the show notes if, okay. if you like, uh, but we, yeah, we just launched that. Uh, you can stream our services live from YouTube as well. Um, and kind of exciting personal news. I, I have a passion for writing and I just launched a newsletter last Sunday and I'll be doing that every week talking about some of these topics. 
Um, and so if you want to subscribe to that newsletter, and I, I, uh, I'll, I describe some of the things that have me thinking, some of the books I'm reading, some of the articles I've found intriguing to try to make a space online for this ongoing conversation. Um, and then you can find me on all the social medias too. Yeah, so you hear that listener, you don't have to pay for a book. <laughs> So this guy, so you just got a lot of respect from a lot of people. I reached out to you. You didn't know me from Adam. Uh, you're not pitching anything. That's what I love. You're pitching the gospel of Jesus Christ and just community of everybody trying to just be the best they can be and let God do his thing. So thank you so much, Benjamin. And I hope sometime to get out to Boise, we need to go fishing. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be a dream come true if you did. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much. So good to be here. Thank you. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Number one, Billboard pianist. Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com.